Good afternoon, everyone, or good evening, uh, and welcome. Thank you for braving what were the elements a little earlier, but I think in honor of today's, this evening's occasion, the sun has come out. But we are delighted you are here to celebrate 100 years of the Stanford Graduate School of Education. And we're celebrating it with a program that is co-sponsored by the Stanford Historical Society and the Graduate School of Education. I'm Norm Robinson, and I am here in two capacities because I have a foot in both camps. I'm a member of the program committee and a former board member of the Stanford Historical Society, and I have my PhD from the Graduate School of Education. Um, and that's the history, not mine, but that of the graduate school that our panelists will be exploring in this afternoon's program. For 100 years, the Graduate School of Education has been educating graduate students to go out into the world to prepare the next generation of educators to improve the ability of teachers to teach and students to learn at all levels and in a variety of different settings, both traditional and non. In my case, in my role as the Stanford Associate Dean of Student Affairs, responsible for residential education, the setting was the non-variety. The student residences at Stanford, where the goal was to have the resident fellows and the resident assistants see themselves not as dorm monitors, but as educators in a non-traditional, non-classroom environment. Before we get to the heart of today's program, I just want to remind everyone of a couple of details. One, the usual one, please remember to silence your cell phones. And two, we are video recording today's program. You'll also see a photographer snapping images. The video will be archived online with other Stanford historical programs as part of our mission to preserve the history of Stanford University. The photos may be shared on social media. To begin our program, I have the pleasure and the honor to introduce the Dean of the Graduate School of Education, Daniel Schwartz. Dan is a cognitive psychologist and the Nomellini and Olivier Professor in Educational Technology at Stanford. He is the author of many landmark papers on the transfer of learning and the role of perception in higher order cognition. His latest book is The ABCs of How We Learn, 26 Scientifically Proven Approaches, How They Work, <coughs> excuse me, and When to Use Them. With lecturer Denise Pope, Dan co-hosts Schools In, the Graduate School of Education's program on Sirius XM radio. Before coming to Stanford, he was a teacher in, and I love this combination of places, Kenya, Los Angeles, and Alaska. <laughs> and maybe Dan will tell us what all three have in common. Uh, he was the GSE's Teacher of the Year in 2015 and was named Dean later that same year. So please join me and welcome Dean of the Graduate School of Education, Dan Schwartz. Thank you, Norm. Thank you, Norm. Uh, that was, uh, and thank you for your service to the GSE as uh, active alumnus. I want to Welcome all of you here, the alumni, uh, my colleagues, uh, friends, emeritus faculty, uh, and the people outside, and of course the historical society. Uh, as I understand, this is a monthly gathering, uh, but this is not just any month. This is our centennial, in case you didn't know. We have our centennial beer that you can take with you, uh, but don't open in the car. So uh, 100 years is a long time. When I got asked to be dean by the provost, John Etchemendi, uh, I met John Crumbolt, who recently retired. He had been a faculty member here for 50 years. And, and he looked at me and he said, you know what, Dan? I've been through 11 deans. And now, we know what he was thinking, right, that, that I eat deans for lunch. But. So uh, we... If, 
I'm, I'm afraid to say anything historical about the school because I suspect it will not be precise. But uh, we were actually a department, one of the founding departments in 1891. And then the Board of Trustees, recognizing how significant education is, uh, created a school. So schools have a much larger mandate than a department. We do a lot of service. And so that, that's what we're celebrating. Today we have 10 centers on campus, depending on how you count. Uh, seven master's programs, 21 doctoral programs, including joint degrees in business, law, public policy. We have about 400 students and about 61 faculty uh, who collaborate with all the schools across campus. So we, we reach out because education is important for every discipline. So uh, some of the School of Education people who have led the way in shaping teaching and learning and policy around the world are here with us tonight. And so I'm very excited to introduce them. Daniel McFarlane is moderating the discussion tonight. He is a professor of education, of sociology, and by courtesy of organizational behavior in the Graduate School of Business, so he's very busy. Uh, Dan's research looks into collaboration and social connection, whether among adolescents, business people, or even faculty at Stanford's interdisciplinary BioX. Uh, Martin Carnoy is the Vita Jacks Professor of Education. Martin came to the School of Education in 1968. So you 50, that's 50. Uh, he's a labor economist and a specialist in comparative analysis with a special interest in the political economy of the educational system. A nice tidbit is that it, Martin expects to hood his 100th PhD student uh, this spring. Did I, is that right? Next spring. Next spring. <laughs> I knew it. See? Nothing, nothing to it's do with time. It's taking longer every year. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Emeritus Professor Rachel Lotan is the former director of STEP, the Stanford Teacher Education Program. It's a model program for the rest of the world. She received an MA from the School of Education in 1981 and a PhD in 1985. So they can't leave. That's kind of the story. <laughs> Uh, her teaching and research focus on academically and linguistically diverse classrooms as well as teacher education. And uh, finally, we have Rita Sanchez. Uh, she earned her BA from Stanford in 1972 and a master's degree from the School of Education in 1973. She's a foundational Latina activist. Rita is a longtime professor of English at San Diego State and a professor emerita of English and Chicano Studies at Mesa College, San Diego. Uh, as a Stanford student in the early 1970s, Rita developed and taught Stanford's first course on Chicana studies and published its first Chicana journal. Rita co-authored the book, Chicana Tributes, Activist Women of the Civil Rights Movement. So that's tonight's panel, and now I would uh, invite Dan McFarland to run the show. So thank you. Thank you. Uh kind of a strange occasion to come to something like this and, and reflect on your own experiences in the place you work. It's like the pinnacle of navel gazing, but it's actually enjoyable. As a social scientist, you know, I, I constantly think about my current environment and try to think about what's going on in it. And the, the Graduate School of Education has been kind of a, a place for me to reflect on that. Um, luckily, along the way, as, a, as a, a new faculty member, I met a graduate student, Ethan Hutt, at the time, who decided to join me in studying the school. And we went through over 100 years of archival material, interviewed uh, ten, uh, ten year, for 10 years all these faculty who are here, some of which who have departed. Um, and we tried to develop this, this history of sorts. And, and I don't really have time to go through everything. So what I can do, though, in a very short period is try to give you one kind of account uh, that sets up our, our panel here and the discussants, um, one kind of account of the school that, that hopefully gives you some context about how it grew and expanded and the process by which that kind of happened as you go through all the archival material and all the kinds of materials that we did. So real quick, let me just begin with a, a, the conclusion, start there, which is, uh, we have a heterogeneous place, right? And it's fraught, if not uh, the key process to it is contention, right? We have very bitter debates at times amongst us. And it swings from era to era in terms of what we value, like what becomes the most important kind of research or what, what kind of program should we do. 
um, and what kind of issues are the most important. But I, I think through this process of contention, um, what's happened is that, the, and the swings of valuation, uh, what happens is that the school kept expanding and we kept going forward. So that kind of debate, that kind of sometimes even messy debate, uh, kind of promulgated us forward so that we're kind of this growing enterprise that does many, many things now. Um, it has many different values. So let me deconstruct this really quick. The, the first point that we're heterogeneous is pretty straightforward. I mean, we're, we're this school in the middle of like all these different kinds of, of demands and concerns. Uh, we have humanities scholars, we have uh, psychologists, we have social scientists, uh, et cetera, right? We're kind of at the crossroads. Um, and we have all these different kinds of values and concerns from our different kind of backgrounds that we try to, to push. Right? So theory, you've heard some of these, theory versus practice. Uh, you have uh, teaching versus research. You have quantitative versus qualitative. Um, we have uh, elitism right? and achievement versus diversity and equality. We have all these concerns and they keep coming up uh, from era to era and they swing back and forth in terms of which ones kind of have dominance and which ones we try to strive for more at that period. And so what I want to do is try to give you some sense of how that happens uh, because this alternation and what, what kind of promulgates us forward. And the first thing is that there are all these external pressures, right? So we're, we're not in some vat, this kind of vacuum. We're actually in a university campus. We're in, kind of embedded in these societal issues. Uh, one example that's very clear is World War II. It, it totally changed the university and the School of Education in a huge way. Everybody shifted, dropped everything they did and went right into wartime research, right? Uh, the other thing is during the 60s you had steeples of excellence, right? Where suddenly we kind of shifted course directly from a practitioner kind of school and went right into social science, right? So we had these kind of moments where things kind of shift due to external pressures, whether it's from up, uh, uh, administration or outside in society. The second thing that kind of pushes this dramatic changes and swings that we have is the participants, they, they turn over. And they don't just turn over in a linear kind of incremental fashion. Students, if you look at how students graduate, they graduate in clumps. They, they show up incrementally, like the same size cohorts relatively, but then they kind of go out in packs. Uh, same thing with faculty in terms of retirements and hiring. Uh, they kind of cluster. And uh, not only that, they kind of cluster with, say, the hiring of a new dean. Uh, or the administration turnover. And all these things kind of conflate. They kind of coincide, these cycles. So you have these punctuated moments in the history of school. It's almost generational, like every 20 years or every 10 years, where things just turn over. All, a lot of the students turn in terms of what they are interested. The faculty who are here and present is kind of different. Even in my 18 years, I don't even recognize half my colleagues anymore. Uh, we've expanded to 60, and half of them are not sure uh, that it's dramatically changed, right? So we have this kind of dramatic change in terms of participants. Uh, the next thing that, that actually adds to this is that uh, we make decisions uh, often where we have to make choices, right? So we all value theory and practice. We all value diversity and elitism often for being at this institution. But often we only have so many resources, so many billets, so many students that we can admit, right? So we have to make choices. And certain kinds of interests take over and win uh, often. And they align vertically through leadership all the way down. And these kinds of synchronization kind of line up and establish uh, these kinds of eras. And so one example, for example, is during the era of uh, President Sterling and Terman, the Provost Terman, where we tried to have steeples of excellence. And it kind of coincided with the same time that Tom James and Dean Quillen, uh, James Quillen were Dean, right? And they came in, and here you have these two kind of alignments of kind of leadership that align up and have this interest that's kind of about steeples of excellence and being an elite university, an elite department. Um, and that coincides with suddenly a bunch of faculty retirements and billets opening up, as well as an influx of money, right? We had this gift that came in for a lot of uh, cash. And with that, what happened was you have this sudden shift right into social science research. So you have kind of a school before that was very practitioner oriented, curriculum development, teacher training of 400 plus teachers a year to kind of this shift into a social science research interest, right? It's not that we jettisoned everything before, we kind of expanded in some ways to do both a little bit. We tend to prioritize one over the other depending on what kinds of adherence for each of those valuations, those movements exist. So you kind of 
start to get this idea here maybe of an institution that's like this boat, right? You, you drive it depending on who is in the, the, the kind of driver's seat. All these different individuals who have become tenured, full professors, deans, provosts, uh, kind of have greater sway over which direction the boat goes. But it starts gaining steam. It has momentum, right? And the people who are left out often contest this, right? And then when things turn over, there's an overcorrection. The boat has to switch, but it has to switch momentum. Um, over the years, though, I don't want you to think it's impossible to change direction. We've kind of become more of an ocean liner, though, right? So meaning like we keep expanding what we do. We've grown uh, larger. We're more influential. If you look at kind of the influence our texts have on the field of research, uh, we have broader appeal than we ever have had before. Um, and we have greater balance across quite a few of these interests that I'm talking about, these kind of valuations. So the, the ship... It, it overcorrects usually. It's usually a, a dean that tries to correct in the prior era's mistakes. Um, sometimes when they mismatch the intellectual movement, they get fired. So there's kind of drama in our history where you have fired deans. Not, not this one. Uh, the times when they align, not, when they align all the way down and up the hierarchy, we have this kind of dramatic shift. Okay? So we have this kind of process, the pendulum swing of interest that keeps happening. Now, uh, what I want to talk about, though, is in this setup is uh, the issues I keep talking about in terms of diversity, in terms of international issues, in terms of teacher training, in terms of students and the kind of turnover. These are things that the, the speakers we have today uh, that they'll address and probably give you far more kind of insight than my brief comments. But I just wanted to give you a general sense that through this kind of constant contestation of a heterogeneous group, that we swing back and forth, but we kind of move forward and expand. And I think through that, it's kind of been quite a success story. Okay. Thank you. So uh, let's have Rachel go first, and each person will talk for a few minutes, and then we'll kind of go to questions. OK. Thank you. So I won't stand behind the podium, because then you won't see me. <laughs> And also, I'm more comfortable just walking around and thinking of you as my students, and then I'm comfortable. Um, when Barbara invited me to be on this panel, um, I said to her that, oh, Barbara, I'm going to check so many boxes for you. Because, um, as Dan said, I'm here since the 80s, and more precisely, since 1980. I came as an international master's student. Um, I got a, P a master's in sociology after that, uh, a PhD, uh, then I was an academic scholar, uh, before that a, pre, uh, a postdoc, and what was interesting was that the money came from Rutgers, but I was at Stanford, and people said, that's the height of smartness. <laughs> um, and then um, I was an academic scholar. Um, co-directed and then directed the program for complex instruction, taught, started teaching in the Stanford Teacher Education Program, <clears throat> and became director in 99, and, um, and a member of the faculty, and now I am emerita. So did you, did you check all the boxes? OK, all right. So I came in 1980. I came as a teacher to get my master's. Because something really bugged me after 10 years of teaching. I had decided, silly me, to try and untrack my classroom. I was teaching um, English in Israel. And it was very tracked. And I decided to untrack my classroom because it bugged me, the inequities and you know all that stuff. And um, I just didn't know how to do it. I had no idea. So I came here and I learned. And I learned not only how to untrack my classroom, but also to a large extent why I needed to do what I needed to do. So I came as a teacher, and now as an emerita, I still think of myself as a teacher of teachers. Uh, I am particularly proud of the fact that as a teacher of teachers, when I am able to support them and 
give them advice and teach them that what I share with them is based on very rigorous conceptual theoretical framework and solid empirical evidence uh, that things work the way they should if the conditions are right. I was very lucky um, as, as I was writing this. I, every other phrase I think that I wanted to say was started with, I was very lucky. So I was very lucky. I was very lucky that um, I was able to participate in many courses um, and learn from a lot of uh, wonderful professors. Um, I remember when I first came here and I saw, you know, the people in, in the education building and I said, oh my God, the textbooks are walking down the corridors. Uh, those were, you know, big names. God. Um, but I was, I was again, um, really lucky that I joined a program that was an intervention-oriented theoretical research program. And those words together uh, might seem um, kind of oxymoronish, uh, but uh, I put them together on purpose because, again, my luck, um, I was in a situation where that tension that Dan was talking about that I'm going to talk about as well uh, was resolved in some really beautiful ways. So I think that when I came and um, I was very lucky to have wonderful peers, wonderful colleagues as graduate students, most of them, most of them Mexican-American, Chicana women, uh, and um, my own um, mentor and professor Elizabeth Cohen, um, the, the kind of, the word that was around was that at the time when there were very few uh, women, Latina women, PhDs, if they were to run a regression, uh, Liz would have a significant beta weight. <laughs> Um, because really she worked with, with so many of us. Um, so we were very aware uh, as graduate students of the tension inherent in many schools of education in R1 universities. And that tension was around the question you know, who are we? Who are we? Uh, faculty in these schools, they spend, as Dan said, inordinate amount of time debating, arguing, fighting, making faces, rolling their eyes, just like seventh graders, <laughs> about the perennial, right, Dan? <laughs> See what I mean? Okay. Uh, the perennial question, uh, who are we and what are we? So they asked the question, is our job to do research and publish books and papers in the tradition of one of the social science disciplines, like sociology, like economics, like psychology? <laughs> Um, anthropology, um, one of the subjects of the humanities, right? art, um, history, which might be actually both. And um, being in the field of education as a site for research, but really we come from a dis disciplinary background. So is that our job? And the answer is, yes, it is. Or the question is, are we a professional school? And uh, is our, uh, are we a school that prepares professionals for the field of education, teachers and administrators and policy makers and so on and so forth? And my answer is, yes, we are. 
Um, I actually, I have to, I have to um, tell a little anecdote. Uh, when I was working on my master's in sociology, because at that time when I had the PhD in, in um, the School of Education, you really had to show that you can do rigor, so you had to go and get a master's or a PhD minor in a discipline. Uh, and I chose sociology and uh, made friends with some you know, graduate students there. One of them came back and gave a talk, and I went to, after, grad, after we graduated, we actually graduated on the same day, gave a talk, and um, I, I went to hear him, and he was talking about, he had huge data, glass ceiling, women, and people of color in management positions, and he presented his tables, and there was a huge debate about um, the beta weights, actually, because of the regressions. And uh, I said, and then it was done. And I said, okay, so we heard the bad news, and where are the good news? And they told me, well, Rachel, for the good news, you have to go over to the School of Ed. Uh, because we start, for, for us in the School of Education, what my friend presented was the problematic situation. That was the first part of any dissertation that we wrote. And then we said, okay, so how are we going to fix that? Okay? So, um, I learned, as I said, um, a lot of information in my classes. But um, I have to say that not all of my classes were truly transformative. Uh, transformative, I meant, do I walk out a different person than I walked in? Um, but I was lucky again because I started with organizing workshops for teachers, real teachers, real kids, here in Ceres. And um, people started complaining about the bathrooms who were not so clean after they left. Um, and I also learned that what we needed to have are um, solid conceptual frameworks and also good data for what we were uh, proposing as interventions. So I learned that. I collected data in real classrooms with real kids. Um, I learned to formulate frameworks and hypotheses and I did regressions. But it was a time also, again, you talked about waves, Dan, where the school started to be active in these kinds of uh, interventions and reaching out to the field. Mike Atkin was the dean when I came in, and he and President Kennedy at the time did the big project of Stanford and the schools, and then there was the accelerated schools, and um, Lee Schulman uh, formed the national board, and as Dan said, the proliferation of, of um, centers uh, that we have now. My job was at first with the program for complex instruction and then as director of STEP. And director of STEP was really the biggest um, joy, professional joy uh, that I could attain. Um, I loved uh, the fact that I was working with teachers. I loved the fact that I could be in the schools, in the classrooms, and that so many of them had the commitment and the fire in them to change the world. And I was, again, very lucky with all the deans. I should also count the number of deans that I had. But um, I, I really, um, whatever I asked, um, I got, which was so great. <laughs> uh, and I was able to advocate for STEP, and STEP became an internationally uh, recognized program. As a matter of fact, right now in this building are about 22 people from several countries who have come to investigate what STEP is about. So, thank you. So 
honored to be here. Thanks so much for inviting me to talk about the experiences of a student during a particular time in history, the making of the civil rights movement and the legislation that Stanford was living up to in the 1970s. That was almost 50 years ago. I'll try to live up to speaking for the tenor of the times, Stanford after the passing of the civil rights legislation and a protest on campus against the Chicano movement, against the Vietnam War by the Chicano movement and other movements around campus. Well, when I first came, I uh, was an undergraduate student and I came, walked right into the civil rights movement. So I think the impact of the activism at Stanford during that particular period is really important to discuss. Uh, described by President Lyman as Stanford in turmoil, but the students called it revolution. And so you can imagine what was, how, what was happening on, on the caps at the time. Chicano students were waking up to their rights as indigenous. So for the first time in history, it, it, not just Stanford, but other prestigious universities as well, students wanted to be a part of the making of the system and having the right to ed education. They thought of themselves as indigenous of the land and citizens by virtue of an international treaty between Mexico and the United States. And they were challenging mistreatment at all levels, probably um, especially in education, because they had felt that they had not received the kind of education that was deserved in the United States. And so they were products of US invasion and colonization. But education was their first priority. That's what they were fighting for. And in the news, you might have heard that they were called militants. However, uh, they were, uh, I guess you would call them revolutionists for education. And I think the question that Rachel made, who am I, who are we, that was one of the biggest questions of all for the Chicano students that were coming to campus. Uh, and I talk about that because I was one of them at the time, but didn't know it yet. And so, um, the biggest question, who are we, was the question of the students, because they didn't have to see themselves written in books. So the educational system had literally failed them. They didn't know who they were because they did not know their histories. And they knew it from maybe the bedside or with, from their parents' laps, but they did not know it from the history books like everybody else. So a little bit of memoir to go with it. Um, to help you see what was happening here at Stanford when I came. Um, I, I was born uh, in San Bernardino, uh, seventh of 11 children, uh, not much different from other Mexican-American girls like myself. We had dreams. You want to go to college. You go to the counselor. The counselor says, no, you can't go to college. I, my counselor said I was a student that had made good grades and had all the, uh, had, uh, the documents in place to go to college, but my counselor said, no, you can't afford it. Your parents can't afford it. So I think that's still happening today. You kind of know the story. You read it all the time. Obviously, I, d I didn't listen. I had great mentors, my three sisters. One of my sisters had gone to Girls State Sacramento, which is two students out of a student body of 2,000 chosen to a leadership program. So uh, my parents let her go because the teachers came to the home, talked to the family, and um, in, uh, convinced my father that this would be a good thing. The other thing that happened is I when I went away to school is that I met a student in my freshman year and got married. <laughs> so I had great dreams of being a reporter. I was working on the Sun, uh, it was called the Tyra Weekly, San Bernardino. We put out a weekly newspaper and you have all these wonderful hopes and dreams uh, to go to school. Um, I applied anyway, despite what my counselor said and ended up at San, San Jose State had this excellent school of journalism, but I was only there for one year. I got married, and what you did in those days is you put your husband through school. So I did that. 
my husband um, went finished uh, San, San Jose State, and then I put him through worked and put him through law school. But the harsh realization was that uh, in a few years, when he and I decided he decided to move on, is that I didn't have a career of my own. So starting all over again, going back as a re-entry mother after 10 years of marriage is kind of the story. So it kind of adds to what was happening to Mexican-American women at the time, what was happening to women in general at the time. And so I'm thinking some of you may identify with my story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, the first thing I did when I first came to campus, the first day at Stanford, was I was called to a, a meeting of orientation. And there was a Mecha student there that said, Mecha is uh, Movimento Estudiantil Chicanos de Aslan. That was a radical statement in those days. And the students wanted to do something to change possibilities so that more students could come more Chicano students, Mexican-American students, who come to this campus. I don't even think the term Chicano was used so much in those days. It was just a beginning format of understanding the international uh, history that we had and the indigenous history that we had. Uh, the mestizaje, they called it. On my first day of campus, it was announced that there had been a protest against the war in Vietnam, and 20,000 20,000 people entered the streets of Los Angeles. It was, uh, it was a legal uh, demonstration, but the police had tried to stop it, and it, it turned into a massive, um, a loss of three lives, uh, actually. I think my eyes were open that day. I had come to Stanford. I was kind of brokenhearted at the time going through this breakup and two daughters to raise. My daughters are here, by the way, Tayana and Lisa. <laughs> And um, I just wanted to hole up in Escondido Village where we found our new home and uh, read poetry. So I was in the English department. And that would be my life, bake cookies. And that would be the end of it. However, it wasn't that way. Because of everything that was happening in the world and on campus and every uh, assembly or in the Tresor Quad, you would hear speakers talking about um, something that needed to be changed. So um, besides all that, my English professor had asked me to be on a committee. Uh, his name was Professor Arturo Islas. I was wondering if anybody in here knew the name. He was our first Mexican-American uh, pr uh, professor after the Civil Rights Movement. Anyway, I graduated in 72. and. Um, went into the STEP program, and I wanted to say something about that, because Stanford teacher education was top um, priority. Education was top priority for us. Um, we were in college, but we wanted to make sure that other people came too. Um, the students there were fighting for the who am I, and where is my language in all of this? Where is my history in all of this? And so um, not to. They were fighting for bilingual education, not to give up English, but to preserve the home language, the Spanish language that they had grown up with. And um, that's important to first generations too, uh, uh, first generation students as well, because to preserve the home language is important. And building confidence and success is what the Graduate School of Education was, was after. So. I took the first courses in women's literature, but I noticed very soon there were no, uh, there were no, there was no Latin American literature. So at the time, there was a program called the Chicano Fellows Program, the Chicano Fellowship Program, and so I applied for that program and decided that I would. We had to make a proposal, so I decided that I would propose a women's course for, in Mexican for Mexican American women on the campus. So not realizing that uh, it was a little bit history making at the time. And I proposed a journal of women's writing so people could see, that the students could see themselves in print. Uh, women were not being published, and certainly Mexican-American women were not being published. 
And so those journals, uh, one of the journals that we published was for Mexican-American women, and other journals had been published there uh, talking about Mexican-American identity and scholarship. And those are kind of first in, in civil rights history, I think, now. But the STEP program, teacher education program, I think was one of the best programs for diversity in education. And that was really important to us at the time. Um, I think the word diversity had greater meaning in those days. It doesn't sound too radical today. But in those days, it was almost a demand that we had the right to an education like anyone else. It offered a credential, a teaching, uh, student teaching and a master's degree. Uh, someone once called it the stepchild, I heard, of the graduate school, but elitist thinking, I'm pretty sure. The nation needed teachers at that time, all different kinds of teachers. After years of neglect and lack of role models, step education and practice, I think, was the answer for me and a lot of other students. Um, it was just uh, theory, it was intellectual pursuit, uh, theory and practice, learning in our own field. I was in English, uh, a diverse program with lots of different colors, how it should be. I thought I, I was teaching in East, Sandy, uh, East San Jose um, at, uh, I think, high-risk students. So I would commute all the way out to East San Jose, and there wasn't a 280 then, <laughs> and drive all the way back home at night and go to classes at night. That's how the STEP program worked. I wonder if it works the same. I think it's just as grueling, kind of like medical school <laughs> it's, and law school. It's not easy, but uh, amazing, because I was introduced to all these students in um, East San Jose. And the students were, for the first time, introduced to a brown teacher they had never known before. We were the first, um, first ones. And Stanford sent us out into the wilds to meet, meet it all. And we took the students back home. I took them to Escondido Village. I took them for uh, walks on campus to Lake Log, anywhere I could, to show them a different kind of life and help them to see that they, too, had the right to go to college. Um, well, I think when you think about these contributions, you may not hear even today very much about what Mexican-American women have contributed, but I, you might know who Dolores Huerta is. Uh, do you? I mean, has anybody heard her name? Everybody's saying yes, yes. I think she came to Stanford recently, I heard. Yes. Well, if she ever comes again, be sure you don't miss her talks. They're pretty radical. Well, you've heard about people like her, but you did not hear about other um, women, all the different kinds of women that had made contributions. So that sort of became a goal of mine, just collecting the names of people that have contributed so much to educational history, to public office, um, to law, uh, to public service. And so I just kind of want to talk about that a little bit today, and so maybe it'll come up a little bit more later. Thank you. You're brilliant. Well, is this on? Yep. I'm really honored to be here. Um, Barbara, thanks for organizing. It's great. Um, so I came here uh, actually in January 69, although I was hired to come here in 68. Um, I, I'm a Chicago economist. I don't know if all you people know what that means. Uh, Milton Friedman was one of my I'll professors. Cry, maybe. <laughs> um, and, and my first job was in Washington, D.C. at the Brookings Institution before I came here. And um, I became a political activist around the war as well as writing books about Latin American trade, even though my thesis was about education. So I came, when I came to be interviewed here, um, I was part of that wave. That wave happened to be four people, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, four social scientists were hired 
1968. We all came more or less at once. Um, it was uh, not driven, I don't think, by any intellectual shift in the university. I think it was driven by the Ford Foundation that gave uh, all these professorships to Stanford, not just in the School of Education, but in the political science department and elsewhere. And the Ford Foundation was, at that time, uh, 1960s, uh, we just have a historian at Stanford who's written a book about it, at School of Education, um, about what happened at the University of Chicago uh, through the Ford Foundation. The Ford Foundation was trying to change uh, the way uh, people thought about a lot of fields, and they felt that social science, rational social science, was the way to do it. So they brought us here. Uh, I told Tom James when he interviewed me, I told him that uh, it was very unlikely that I would come uh, because at the time I was uh, running, um, I ran Bobby Kennedy's um, primary in D.C. and uh, we won big and I was on my way out to Los Angeles to work on the California primary and I stopped here and gave a talk and Tom says, we want to give you a job and I said, eh, I think I'm going to be in the White House. But you know, give me the offer anyway. But so things happened and I came to Stanford. And I was hired into the International and Comparative Education Program. Um, and it's been economics of education, which I'm also associated with, and comparative education are two very growing fields. Very growing fields. And I'm happy that both of them are growing at the same time. It gives me a lot of clout and business and uh, policy influence. It's great to be in that situation. Much better than to be in the dying field. Um, so you may, I don't know how much you know about international education in this, uh, at Stanford. Uh, it's, um, you may not realize how important a program it is, just, not just in the school, but in the university. Um, we've, on average, we've had three professors, three faculty members, not professors necessarily, but three faculty members, uh, assistant professors and professors, in that program. And out of the 2,000 PhDs that have been produced from 1970 to 2016 in the School of Education, 220 of them have been in international education. 11 percent, and, and plus more than 1,000 master's degrees, it's the second largest program after STEP. We have people literally all over the world in influential positions. We have populated all the international programs in the country are populated by our graduates because of our focus on uh, training. And when Dan said, uh, which has now become practically my only claim to fame in the School of Education, I produced these 100 PhDs, nobody ever paid attention to me until I told Barbara this fact. And all of a sudden, people started coming to me in the halls and saying, wow, you know, things like that. <laughs> so, but the, I'm, it's actually one of the proudest things for me to have done this, because I think this is the real legacy of the School of Education. I mean, all these waves going back and forth and all this kind of stuff. The fact that we produce so many teachers, really excellent teachers, the fact that we produce all these policy people, the fact that we've had presidents of countries that have been our PhDs, and that we have all these faculty members all over the country been our PhDs. Our School of Education, percentage-wise, produces more academics than any other university in the country. It's true. We have the highest percentage of academics, taking people taking academic jobs coming out of School of Education, of any university. So um, what's interesting is that not only do we produce all these people, we, as a, as a program, uh, and I have to say this about the economics of education too, but not quite as much, the international program the research in the international program has transformed the field. 
nationwide and worldwide, really worldwide. We've done more theoretical work here at Stanford in this International Comparative Education than any other place by far. We were voted by far the most influential program in the world by our colleagues uh, in, the, in the field. Uh, this was in 2004. And even, I, I want to say that not only did we do that, but international education was probably the first international program in the university. Paul Hanna, who founded the program in 64, way back in the early 40s, I mean, even in the 30s, he came here in 36. Um, he had written a social studies textbook for Scott Forsman that had made him a lot of money in the middle of the Depression, and he was able to build the Hanna House. He had met um, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright in New York when he was a professor at TC, and had gotten Frank Lloyd Wright to design his house for him and his, his wife. Uh, it was supposed to cost $36,000. It ended up costing $51,000. I don't know if you've ever seen it. I mean, if you imagine a house costing $36,000, well, $51,000 to build. Anyway, the fact that he had $51,000 in the 1930s was already amazing. He did pretty well. He bought some redwood stands with other professors here in the school, and they did even better. Anyway, didn't give any of his money to the school, by the way. He gave it to the Hoover Institution. <laughs> There's a big story about that, why that happened. Anyway, I mean, there are different versions of the story, but it's, it's, there's some consistency. In any case, what's interesting about Hannah was that back in the 30s, Stanford is a private institution depended on tuition. Now, if you're a, depending on tuition in the middle of the Depression, you might be in trouble. And we were in trouble. But uh, Herbert Hoover, who was chairman of the Board of Trustees at the time, so hated Roosevelt that he would not take any federal money. Other universities were getting federal money. Hoover refused. And the university almost went broke because Hoover refused to take money. Finally, and Hannah was trying to get him to take federal money. And eventually, Hannah and another professor established an office in Washington and started bringing money after Pearl Harbor. You know, everybody had to support the president, even Hoover. Anyway, so, <laughs> well, he got pretty burned, you know. So I can imagine he wasn't happy. But the point is that Hannah played such a key role in bringing international international perspective to the university. And he was very active in the 40s and 50s. He had a vision of education that, he, that education would be, you know, our post-World War II policy was mainly to take over, uh, to say American democracy was going to save the world. And it was really an idealistic movement, the United Nations included. And he was part of that. And this program in 64 was really the first kind, even before Latin American studies, they, they were just forming even later, and all these area studies, they didn't exist. And international education existed. So um, Stanford has since become, of course, a global brand. I'm sure you know that. Do you know that? It's a global brand. Um, and our international pro program continues to be a leading player in that brand. Um, we define, in part, that brand. In Mexico City in 1991 was the only event of the centennial held outside of the United States. There was an event in Mexico City as part of our centennial in 1991. The two biggest groups in Mexico at that centennial event were engineering and school of education. All right. So I just want you to know that the School of Education is part of the international branding of Stanford University. It started with us, and it continues with us. We probably produce more genuinely international students out of the, to go out and work as international students, not to come here and populate Silicon Valley, but to actually go back and work in international areas probably than any other department in the university. So um, that's it. That's, I want you to know you're international. <laughs> we're, we're, and we're making sure 
that that continues. Uh, we, uh, I, I'm going to have Dan ask us some questions about why we've had so much trouble maintaining ourselves in the school. But the fact is that we're doing pretty well now, and we're really happy with, uh, with, with the way the school's treating us today. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. So you've heard from three or four of us. So I think the, the thing that would be good is to kind of come back to each speaker and just ask them a quick question. And if you have follow-up questions, we can just open it up from there, okay? Uh, so let, let's start with Rachel. And in terms of, this is someone who is a student, a faculty member, a director, and now emerita. I think one of the, the key things that, that I would like to know, and I, perhaps a lot of people out there, is um, from your experience, kind of how has the graduate student experience changed in this arc oh. of time for you? And what, what do you see as one of these big shifts? Um, it's, a, it's actually a huge shift. Um, when I was a graduate student, I think there was about 500, the size of the school, I think was larger than now, and the faculty was smaller. Um, and there was no secured funding. And boy, did we have to hustle. Um, before, at the end of each quarter, we sometimes didn't know where the next uh, RA ship or TA ship uh, was going to come from. And um, it was, it was um, not easy to find um, enough projects at the time. Uh, now, it's a completely different situation, I think. Um, I think you probably know, Dan, the ratio of uh, PhD students to faculty is probably much smaller than it used to be. Um, and um, since funding is guaranteed uh, at first for four years and then for five years, um, not enough funding still because we're in Silicon Valley, but it's, a, it's really a, a very different situation that graduate students find themselves in. Uh, the other, the other um, thing I think that was different was that, um, and there, there is, it, it might seem trivial, but I think it's very consequential that courses were actually um, happening twice a week, either Mondays and Wednesdays or Tuesdays and Thursdays, and they were two-hour classes. Um, and so there were double the number of meetings per quarter than what uh, there is now, because most classes now are three-hour classes, uh, except the pro -sem, that is two. Um, and I think that that changes uh, some, some of the teaching and learning conditions um, for, for the graduate students. Um, and then the last thing that I want to say is, that occurs to me, is that actually faculty had office hours. And they were in their offices during office hours. Um, that ain't happening. <laughs> Uh, as much uh, as it used to, um, because I think because of hmm? email. email, right? And and everybody works at home. And and Martin, I think that you are an exception because you are you have presence at the school. But but very often um, you need to make an appointment with a faculty member and um, hmm? and they weeks in advance because they are you know flying around the world anyway. Um, so, so that I think, and that and that has changed, um, and it it's a consequential change. Well, so uh, speak. I don't know if I'm on. Speaking speaking of which, like as a student activist, I mean, what we see over the years is we have increasing numbers. I mean, you were the first runner kind of uh, individual, but now we see these increasing numbers of student activists. How do you think that's changed, like in terms of what you see, in terms of the kind of student activist researcher? It's changed. I think it's changed for the better, really, because what I'm seeing today, and I got a chance actually to talk to students today in the Centro Chicano with a 
Francis today and meet a lot of the students. I was just a thrill. I couldn't believe how impressed I was with your Stanford students today. They're gorgeous. <laughs> I, at the end of the evening, I, at the end of the luncheon, I met uh, a, a student that had just was about to graduate. She's been in Stanford Law School for three or four years. I think it's three years it takes, but she's about to, to graduate and she talked about her particular experience. And I asked her how hard it was, and to her, it's, it, it's not hard. <laughs> she loves it so much. She's so well taken care of. She, chimes have changed. Um, uh, uh, things sound good to me. Uh, one other student said that um, it didn't sound like the activism of today was very much like it was in my era in the, in the civil rights movement. But she did say that it, that it does happen, though. She said that uh, uh, in their dorm, I think they had some signs put up that were racist or accusatory. And she said it was immediately reported to Stanford. And Stanford steps in and doesn't want and doesn't approve of that kind of thing. So uh, the students are very engaged today. Um, almost like they were in our day, but differently, and I think very protective. <laughs> and international students, too. I mean, you've seen the arc of this. How, how's that changed for you as well? About their active, how they behave? Well, what kind, of, what kind of international student do we have today that was different from when it started in the 70s? Well, I think the students, the 60s. Uh, every, all our students are much more concerned about uh, jobs than they were in the 1970s. In the 1970s, um, everybody got a job. <laughs> it was, you, know, you, got, you got a degree from Stanford, you know, you had a job. So I mean, people, one of the reasons that the activism has changed, well, I think one of the reasons that students could be more active in, in the 60s and 70s is because they didn't have to worry about what was gonna happen after university. Uh, it was uh, it was just a different it was a, and I think you know I'm an economist I think labor markets are important but even when I interact with the students one of the reasons I mean people used to finish their PhDs in less time on mm -hmm. average mm -hmm. and I don't think it's because uh, intellectually it's harder to finish a PhD now than it was then although I think the standards uh, have actually risen uh, I must say but um, I think they're scared I think this is the you know, right now, it, it looks to them like being a graduate student is pretty comfortable, mm -hmm. com even with the low salaries and, uh, you know, uh, limited housing conditions, et cetera. It's a lot better than the unknown. And the unknown is ever present in terms of the job market. We do very well in terms of placing our students, but the students themselves don't feel, they just don't feel this kind of guaranteed Things. So I think that really changes the way people behave. And I agree, they're active. I mean, that's not yes. a question of activism. Yeah. I wanted but, to yeah, but add you, that to but yeah. you, I mean, the place was, I mean, you remember what it was like. It's, it's, it's not like that. Today. Yeah. <laughs> it was good. It was, it was wild. <laughs> it was and, wild. <laughs> and it was, it was good wild. It was good wild. You were learning it more outside the classroom than you were learning inside the classroom. And the university, the university was a place where people were shouting at each other, and that's good. I think it's good. And I think the, 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 these, I, I, I don't want to say the wrong thing, but this idea of the microaggressions and all this stuff, nobody talked like that. I mean, you were supposed to microaggress people because, <laughs> the, uh, but you still could respect each other. I think, uh, I think it's really important. I, I can't, I, I, times have changed. Now, there are lots of good things about it and, and other bad things, but when I, people, the students I talk to just cannot imagine what Stanford was like when I arrived here in 1969 and 70 and 71 and 72. Yeah. This is your era yeah. as an undergraduate. And yeah. I think when I, talk, when I heard you talking, I, felt, I started feeling so nostalgic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's the trouble. We can't get too complacent. And I think there is this drawing towards the nostalgia of the times. But I think remembering it is really important because it helps us to come back to 
the kinds of things that are really urgent today, and then kind of thought about it after you asked me that question, the, the students have really serious activism going on today. The indigenous rights movement is very powerful today, although it isn't as in, in the news as much as it should be. Uh, there's been major divestments made, say, by major uh, banks in uh, contributing toward uh, the pipeline, the Dakota pipeline. Uh, that's because of student activism. That's because of indigenous activism. Uh, the other thing they're, they're protesting is DACA, and they're starting, uh, masses of students are starting to support the dreamers and care about humanistic concerns as opposed to creating a wall. And women's marches are major today. They're just hundreds of people come out for, for women's marches, and women are stronger today than they've ever been. The activism is, it, it, it's, it's there. It's, it's not going to wane. As long as there's hate in the world, good is going to overcome. So one other question for you guys is we're, we're doing a lot of history, like reflections, but what, what do you hope for in the future in your respective perspectives here? What do you hope to see us go forward on in terms of international education or well, STEP or yeah. activist? Kind of? You know, we've been at, the, as I said, we've been at the forefront of defining the field. Uh, uh, I wrote a, a book this past year about about this 50 years of what we of what's been done, I cover a lot of material. I gave Barbara the most interesting chapter, which was mm -hmm. about all the shenanigans that went on in in the you know in the program vis-a-vis -vis the university and the school. But the the fact is, it's a very interesting question because um, right now interna in international education, everything is being driven by um, international tests. Uh, I don't know how many people have heard of the PISA test or the TIMS test, right? And so comparative education is comparing countries on these tests. Okay? Depends how you do on the tests. And that's being driven by an outside agency, the OECD, uh, basically in Paris. Uh, why they're doing this, I don't know. But they're having a tremendous influence on the way we define comparative education. And I can honestly say that Stanford is not anymore defining what the discussion should be about. The discussion is, is elsewhere. And the question for us, I think, is how do, we, how, how do we respond to that? Because there's a lot wrong with that discussion. We just taught, of course, uh, Guillermo uh, Solano and I, who's, he's, uh, uh, he looks at tests and language and it's very, very interesting. It's, it's wonderful to co-teach with my faculty members, I, fellow faculty members. I just love it, but particularly someone that's really far away from what I do. I, I learned so much from that class, and I, maybe he learned something too. And so we thought, we thought about this, and it's really remarkable how much is, is bad about what's going on with these international yep. tests, both from the way they're constructed and the way they're um, interpreted and how they're used. Now, how, how, do, how do we as academics respond to that? that? That's what I would say is our main task now for the future. That's good. Well, I'm, I'm um, hoping that the School of Education will continue to be um, a, a, a fertile intellectual place um, where you know, knowledge is produced and practice is practiced, but where, where everybody cares. And I'm using the word caring um, in a sense that Nell Noddings defined it. Um, I think that caring about the kids, caring about the students, because I, Rita, I would add to the activists, the high school students today. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. my granddaughter, who's 13 in, in middle school, is at home preparing posters for tomorrow's mm -hmm. walkout. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it's, it's, it's the hope. Uh, yes. And it, it comes about because we care. Yeah. Um, 
And so I hope that that continues. Yeah, because one of the innovators of that was uh, the film industry because the, the movie that came out in the, uh, probably came out in the 80s, about the uh, 70s, was called Walkout. And that's an important film. It's a precursor to what's happening today with the students that are fighting against what happened to them. Death on campus is horrifying. And so the film Walkout was one of the products of that particular period that showed that student activism is finally what led to change in the Los Angeles school districts, uh, uh, the Los Angeles schools, where students were not given any hope for change. They were sat in the back of the room and that sort of thing. And so I think uh, if more messages come out like the one that you're talking about, more messages about um, standing up, students standing up for their rights and no, telling the, the American public that they're not, they're not going to take it anymore and they have something to say um, and their voices need to be heard. I think that's one of the things I hope for in the future because it was so much, and I think so much a productive part of my growing up at Stanford, is that when students uh, spoke out, people did listen and change did happen. So uh, I think that's really Im important. Um, one of the things that happened for me was that I was called to different conferences because I was sort of the only person at the time. In other words, uh, there were a handful of students to start with, and then they grew. But at, if you're on, the only one in the English department, you're the one that gets called to a writer's conference. Uh, it could be a Latin American writer's conference. And then you're called to speak. You're not the poet, but you're the one that's called to speak for the, for the people. And at that time, because you asked about activism and how it happens today, I think what happened for me is that I was able to sort of articulate for the students what revolution means besides just going into the streets. Uh, that's imp per perhaps important too, but for me it was writing because I was an English, prof English student then an English prof professor. So um, I wrote an essay called Chicana Writer, Breaking Out of Silence, and I think that essay helped a lot of students to sort of come out and talk on paper or in the news or wherever they could about their particular experience to broaden the message and to get other people to hear. That's great. Well, so I assume a lot of you probably have questions oh. that you would like to have addressed. So why don't we open it up to whatever people want to ask. Do you have a mic? There's, There's someone at the back. And we do have microphones, so if you can wait till you get a microphone, if you have a question, so we can record your answer or your question for the recording. You mentioned testing, especially the international tests, but there is also so much of an emphasis on testing in American schools with American tests, whether they are state level tests primarily or otherwise. With all the emphasis on testing, where do you see K through 12 curriculum development going? There used to be frameworks, and I think there still are, mainly developed at the state level. There used to be a few dominant textbooks, some of them state-adopted textbooks in many states. But now, uh, and for a while now, there's been the Khan Academy and various other independently produced sources of curricular materials. Where do you see this all going? <laughs> I, think, I think each of us is going to have a lot to say about that. Do you want to go first? Sure. Um, so I, I personally um, had great hopes when the core curriculum standards came out because after the, the um, you know, what we call the accountability um, machine that, that we had with, with the No Child Left Behind that um, we were looking towards um, more progressive education uh, that brought with it different kinds of ways to 
assess what students know and are able to do. Um, and it's a process. Um, it is harder to implement than, of course, than you know, people think uh, that is going to happen. Uh, but California, I think, is on the forefront of trying to do that and, and changing what happens in the classrooms, changing what, uh, the way that, that um, students learn and teachers teach. Uh, and also changing, hopefully, the ways that um, the kids are assessed um, by multiple measures, by performance assessments, by actually looking at what they are able to do rather than, you know, filling out those standardized tests. Um, and it is, it, is a, it is a tension, again, because changing turning that around uh, takes a lot of investment and a lot of time. You know, as an economist, I have a kind of love-hate relationship with tests. I, I love tests for data purposes, uh, but I know too much about them to realize that what they're measuring may not be really accurate. And uh, certainly the way they're used in many cases, is totally inappropriate given what, how the tests were designed and what they're supposed to do. So um, as far as driving curriculum, uh, I think the, the standards, the math standards, for example, that were adopted, that were developed in the late 80s, were, were they, in those states where they were really implemented seriously, like in yeah. Massachusetts, Minnesota, yeah. et cetera, they had a big effect yeah. on kids' learning, as measured by tests, by the way. Uh, that's the only way we know that. Uh, so, but it, it apparently, uh, today, we don't know what's going to happen with Common Core. Uh, where it's being adopted and the tests that are being written have been revised, whether they've been revised adequately to pick up uh, what the Common Core is doing uh, is, is a question that still hasn't been answered. But the, the fact is that, um, it, as far as I'm concerned, it, it isn't, if you just want to measure something about kids' uh, performance on these tests over time, uh, the good news is that despite all the, the uh, political hay that's being made by people saying how terrible American education is, the fact is that on the national tests, on the National Assessment of Educational Progress, whatever it's measuring, it's gone up, and particularly in math, by a lot over the last 25 years. And just looking at, when I looked at my daughter's textbook when she was at, at Pali uh, seven or eight years ago in math, compared to what I learned in math, or even what my older kids learned in math, the math textbook was a lot better, and they were learning a lot harder stuff uh, than, uh, and it was better math than I learned, uh, and, and just in terms of doing math. So, uh, I, I think progress is being made in curriculum, uh, it, irrespective of the testing. You know, I think I think people are learning how to write better curricula. I think the only thing I would add to that is the importance of recognizing culture in uh, making up tests. And then also that some studies were done with the bilingual education where students that tested or studied in their home languages did much better. So uh, some, of the, some of the advancements were made when students could learn math in their native or home language and um, therefore, uh, their scores would be improved. And, and let, let me add, from tests, we know from the National Assessment of Educational Progress that our teaching of English to people who come into school not knowing English is really bad. Our teaching that these kids, anything, not just English, 
of math, science, everything that they're learning. They do much, much worse than the, than the kids who are not in uh, ELL, yeah. English language learners. Much, much standard deviation difference. Uh, it's because of the segregation. It's, it, I, it, I think it's not only because of the segregation. I think we're terrible at teaching kids languages. As a large insular country, we don't really understand what it is to teach kids languages. I was once accosted by a drunk in the, in the Stockholm subway. <laughs> and a guy in his 40s, I would say, I would guess, he looked older. And he, he was asking for money, obviously, in Swedish. And I told him I had one, learned this one thing in Swedish, which is I don't speak Swedish. And so I said to him, I don't speak Swedish in Swedish. And then he came back at me in perfect English. I, I mean, he was drunk. And he was speaking perfect English. So, of course, I gave him quite a bit of money. I said, this is impressive. I, I, I mean, he was a homeless drunk. And he was bilingual. At least, probably. <laughs> at least bilingual. We're not bilingual. All right, next question. Uh, so... When I was an undergraduate here many years ago in the time period that you were, you've been discussing, um, the School of Ed had no presence in our curriculum or our life. Um, is that true today? And if so, why, why is it that you aren't present in the undergraduate uh, curriculum? Well, so we, we have a, a minor now. Uh, is that right? Yeah. Well, actually, he can answer yeah. that. 20% of the graduate schools But we, we did have a, a, a bachelor's program in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and then it kind of 50s. Do I stop somewhere? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I feel this off the top of my head. But it, it did end as we became a graduate school. But we, I think now we, we have mostly in courses, like Dan said, undergraduates. And I thought we had a minor where you can have an honors uh, program. We did, right? Yeah. Both. Yeah. So we're, we're doing some effort there, but I don't, I think there's a little bit of a politic involved with sharing undergraduates with other H&S depart, no? So I have to keep turning to the, <laughs> the powers that be for the current climate, but yeah. so the next. My microphones make me nervous, so um, uh, I was going to say two things. One, I teach both math and ELD, so I wanted to make a comment on two. One was, you're right in one sense, is that we don't teach bilingual, I mean, ELL very well. We don't teach English. We don't know how to teach right. English. It's right. absolutely true. Mm -hmm. I would point out that if you have a class full of Hispanics, Chinese, a kid from Mexico, Guatemala, Salvador, China, mm -hmm. Afghanistan, Philippines, India, it's going to be hard. Okay, you get a, you, it's very difficult to teach English, and we don't. You're right. We basically wait for them to learn it, and we teach them a lot of enrichment in the meantime. However, when you talk about how badly they do, you've got to remember we've RFEPed out all the ones yes. that learn. So we're leaving behind yes. the kids who don't. Yes. And overwhelmingly, I think it's most children get out of ELL within six years. So if you look at the kids who are in ELL after six years, many of them, I think 30% of high school long-term ELLs are citizens. Yes. So cut us a little bit of slack on that. I'm, I'm, ta I'm, talking, about, <laughs> I'm talking about fourth graders. Okay. But even so, by then you're not at the sixth grade level. So uh, the point is, is that we have a lot of long-term ELLs in that group, so it's hard to tell. But my main, uh, what I really wanted to talk about was, I think it's fascinating that we've seen this arc of, um, we went through both the Bush and the Obama eras, which had very similar ideas about education policy. Clinton in fact, too. Yeah. Yes. And so when we think about that, we're now out of it. I mean, reformers pretty much got their butts handed to them, right, and said goodbye. And now under the era of ESA, we're in a very different world. And I'm wondering how that's changing, how you're training teachers, or how you're, you know, looking at international education, how you're dealing with that change. Because I think it's been just epic if you look at the ESSA compared to No Child Left Behind. Well, I can tell you from, from comparative, in a comparative way, it's really interesting. I, uh, we're, we're compared as a country to other countries, but we don't have a national education system. So 
it's kind of a silly exercise to start with. But if you look at individual states, there are states in the United States that have made real change, have made tremendous progress, and are performing at a world-class level. Okay. Uh, and they're diverse. They're much more diverse than the countries they're being compared with. So a state like Massachusetts has six and a half million people. Finland has four and a half million. Massachusetts is much more diverse. And uh, the kids in Massachusetts score higher on the PISA reading than the kids in Finland, and they score about the same in math. Uh, if you go to Minnesota, North, North Carolina, Texas, and mathematics has made tremendous progress. All these states have done very well. And there are other states that have not done very well. And it is a product of reform. So the reformers, I don't agree that the reformers had their butts kicked. I think that uh, there are many states that are doing reforms that are really honestly stupid uh, uh, because they're ideological rather than thinking about what works. They're just doing it for ideological reasons, like Kansas. We can, you know, we can defund schools and they'll still operate. Uh, to, to, uh, other states are doing serious reform. I mean, North Carolina in the 90s under Jim Hunt, or Texas back in the 80s, made really big changes. Massachusetts in the late in the 90s also, they made changes. We know how to do this. We know how to do this, and it works. It works. You can actually get kids learning better. You can get teachers working better. We know how to do these things. We're trying to bring some of this stuff to Brazil. I'm working, believe it or not, with Rachel on a great program to try to reform teacher education in Brazil. It's not easy, but you know, we're starting small and we're going to try to do it. Uh, because we think that we know how to do this. And it, it seems to work. It seems to work. So uh, uh, I think these national administrations are not the place to look. I think Betsy DeVos is going to have a mil minimal effect on American education, honestly. She is. She is not, not, she structurally can't have much of an effect. I mean, yes, she can promote a voucher program in Ohio, or she can do this and that. But that's trivial compared to what's really happening in American education. California itself is doing stuff that has nothing to do with Betsy DeVos. And you could say equally that other states are doing the same thing. And they're not, they're not, they may get some funding from her, but it's trivial compared to the funding decisions they make about what they want to do. So um, we, I mean, we do have a problem that states don't want to raise money locally, uh, and our universities are suffering because of that, mainly our university, but also school systems. Uh, but I think in terms of reform, uh, and we've studied this in this school. I mean, there are very few people in the outside who will realize that schools of education like ours are very big policy units, policy research units. We do training of teachers, we train people, that's our main task. But on the other hand, we also do a lot of policy research and a lot of basic research to look to the future about how things should be way down the road, like uh, Dan and his group looking, looking at how kids think and how kids learn. Those are things that'll take hold 10, 15 years from now. So we do all those things. Um, and we always have, by the way. Uh, when I first came, people were doing the same thing. So Maybe a different set of things, but the same thing. We have time for just one last question over here on your right. I would like to acknowledge the fact that it's, it's really wonderful that the School of Education has such a wonderful reputation internationally. But as a product of uh, the 1950s, a five-year program in elementary education where we learned both theory and practice, and we had three entire years of undergraduate before we even took a psych class, and that we had all kinds of fabulous experience. I practically had a history major, but had an elementary credential. We wrote curriculum, et cetera, and, and put a lot of theory and action in our teaching over the years. What my real question is, I am one of those on the pendulum of wanting to have more teachers come out of our student body. I see a bl needs blind entrance to Stanford University. Many students on faculty, on 
on scholarship or work study or whatever it happens to be. Those students are the products of good teachers who have taught them to be interested in civil rights, et cetera. I want more of those teachers who go to Haas, et cetera, and do have summer experiences. I want more of those teachers to be products of Stanford University's undergraduate program, practically with whether there's elementary or whether it's a STEP program. When my own daughter went through, this, through Stanford and graduated in 86, there was a senior who was a theater major who had no idea that there was a STEP program. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there has to be a lot more publicity of what is available. Mm -hmm. Grantedly, you may have a finite amount of money that you can spend on undergraduate education and having students come into your, your graduate programs, whether it's a, a BAMA program. But I'd really like to see that happen. I've been advocating for this for the last year, years I came back from being in Germany and learning to speak German fluently, I have, you know, I have taught Germans to speak English with my Stanford undergraduate BA, MA in elementary education. I feel that our students should get out there in the classroom as many as possible. I've been told it's all a matter of money. They all want to make a lot of money when they graduate from here. But there are also students who are very much interested in civil discourse, political science, and interested in advocating for change. So yeah. that's what I want to say. Yeah, so I, may I respond? Yeah, please. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, and Michelle, I'll respond to your question as well. <laughs> um, so in California, uh, the law is that teacher education happens post back. okay? So you have to have first the uh, um, bachelor's degree, a BA or a BSc, and then you go to a uh, teacher credential program. Do you have a BA in elementary education? No, no, not in no education, more. no more. That's the Ryan, no more. Uh, more, it, yes, yes, it's the law in California. Um, some places now, now are doing what they call blended program, which is basically what, what you went through and I think how the School of Education here started, that exactly, you, you, you take your subject matter, uh, some discipline, and with it, the credential. Um, but that's, that's today, just not the law. But um, what you said about um, the, the cost and the money, um, there are a lot of, relatively within the small group of STEP, uh, relatively quite a good number of co-terms of, of young, young students who come undergraduate, finish undergraduate and come to STEP, both elementary and secondary. What made a huge difference for STEP was the forgivable loan, the Avery forgiveness loan. Uh, that allowed us to accept students who otherwise would not have been able to come to Stanford. It was a tremendous gift. And um, you know, it was a $10 million uh, endowment that um, the president, uh, Hennessy, matched. So it's a $20 million endowment that provides forgivable loans to, step, to teacher candidates and for teaching for at least four years. So it's an amazing thing, but I'm so with you. I really hope, are you listening, Dan? I really hope that I will live to see the day where STEP becomes free. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and, and You'll it have would a lot be, of takers. I, yes, <laughs> yes, also, yes. yes. Okay. Also, the words that you spoke were just so, uh, so reminiscent of the messages that were coming out of the civil rights movement activism and, and, and even today. Because you know, if you want to end poverty in this country, if you want to end violence in this country, it's about education. And so what we need is we, what we fought for in those days was called the Stanford uh, Coalition and it was students, faculty, and administrators talking together like this. And that was the message. The, mass, the message was recruitment and retention and education and paying attention to students that were in the streets that needed, that were at-risk students, 
that with problems in the world today, the way to end the problems is education, and the way to reach the students is through better teachers. And so the whole idea is to promote that very thought. And you know, the idea of free step is incredible. And to, it has to be, happen today, because today we're fighting against everything, setting back civil rights movements for 100 years. And so um, thank you for your comment about that. And, and it's not enough. It's not enough because parents, I mean, I have undergraduates who have come to me with you know, tears in their eyes uh, saying, I told my, actually, a, a chemistry major <laughs> who was here, an undergraduate chemistry major, uh, who came to STEP and his parents told him, no, no, and you're going to, we spent, we spent a quarter million dollars almost for you to just become a teacher. And not only that, but after you're just a teacher, you can barely make enough money to subsist, particularly in the Bay Area. Yeah. So, so all of those, and you know, I can tell you stories about that as well. So that, that the, the, not only the recruiting, but the conditions of teaching and the conditions in the schools mm -hmm. and the way that teachers are not at the moment respected, but rather blamed for everything mm -hmm. that happens, mm -hmm. uh, is what, what is a huge hurdle. It's a yeah, huge challenge. And now, yes, OK, let's not yeah. go there. But you, you know, yeah. we, we may have to change our, uh, the curriculum. Yeah. We may have to change mm -hmm. the curriculum, because uh, people are obviously not equipped today to deal with the amount of information that they're bombarded with. They're just not equipped to deal with it because the amount of information that most people were trained to deal with is much more limited than what you're getting today. How do you interpret stuff coming across all the social media? How do you interpret that? Uh, I really believe that schools are going to have to become responsible for training not only in mathematics, basic stuff, mathematics, science, and stuff, but really how to think differently about what is happening in terms of the kind of information people are receiving and how they're receiving it. And uh, we, we, are growing, we are moving into an era of intolerance that is beginning to look like the 1930s. And this mm -hmm. is not just in the United States. It's happening all over the world. Mm -hmm. a, a lot of polarization. Uh, uh, we went through a long period where people were actually becoming more tolerant of each other. And I think that's that's disappearing, and for whatever reason, in an era which is a lot richer everywhere in the world than it was in the 1930s. That's our buffer. In a way, that's giving us a buffer to give us time to do something about it. But uh, maybe we in the School of Education, Dan, should come up with, uh, uh, come up with a, a professor that studies information and uh, the transmission of information and how to deal with it in schools. I, Sam I, Weinberg. Is well, I know Sam good. Weinberg is dealing with it. Well, I we need, we need yeah. more than. Yeah. I yeah. studied literature and uh, British literature and then American literature. But then when I got to the uh, university, there were students out there that were trying to transfer so they could pass English and go to the university. And so it became a real practical problem. And so what happened is you got all those students that you named before the Vietnamese students, the Chicano students, uh, the, uh, the Asian students, and each one of them has a unique, different problem. But there's something happens to you if you love teaching, and a kind of determination sets in, and you want to reach those students. So what happens is you want to reach them to pass. So what you do is each one of them is different. So you go to each one of them, and you begin to teach them on a unique one-to-one -one level. And when you do that, change does happen. It does seem like, I used to call it a ditch digger's job. So you might have a classic education, but in the classroom, 
you find ways to uh, reach out to students to get them to, uh, to pass on and then transfer and then become part of the university. Tiana, do you have a question? Just in the interest of time, um, I know it's getting just a bit late. I mean, if, if some of our speakers can perhaps stay after, I know some of you have some burning questions and they may be able to stay, um, but also we don't want to keep you too long. Uh, just on behalf of the Stanford Historical Society, I want to thank um, all of our speakers, really, for a wonderful program this evening. So let's thank you. Thank you. And a huge thanks to the Graduate School of Education for hosting us this evening and for putting on the wonderful reception outside. Um, before you all go, just a quick word about some of our upcoming programs. We are rounding up uh, the end of our year, so we just have a couple of more uh, Historical Society programs left. In a, uh, at the end of this month, actually, we do have a members-only program at the Stanford Home of Champions. It's over at the uh, Athletics uh, Center that is only for members because we do have a limited space there. So if you aren't a member, this is a great chance uh, to join. We've got information on the table outside and Charlotte's out there. We're giving a little incentive for you tonight. Uh, if you become a new member, we do have some lovely Histor Historical Society tote bags and some note cards, which will be yours to take home if you join today or if you want to donate a membership um, if you're already a member. Then in April, we have a program on the Faculty Senate, which is also celebrating its 50th anniversary. And then in May, to round out our year, we are doing um, our annual meeting and a very special program on the uh, heart transplant uh, at Stanford, the history and the future of heart transplants at Stanford. Um, so we hope you'll be able to join us for that. You can find dates and registration information on our website at historicalsociety.stanford.edu. Again, thank you for everyone for coming, and thank you to our speakers for a wonderful program. Have a good night. Thank you.